Well, just in case, we will have two sessions this evening divided by a coffee break downstairs for about 15 minutes. And at the end of each session, the one starting now and after the coffee break, we will have the usual questions, answers, and open discussion. So at that time, speak up if you like. It was suggested yesterday that we use some of the books being sold at the table there as the basis for some of our discussions. So tonight, this morning, we use the Mystic Path to Cosmic Power. Tonight, we're going to use Pathways to Perfect Living. And I'm going to read very brief sentences, list of sentences, one at a time, from this book, after which I will discuss them and then maybe you'd like to discuss them when we open the meeting <coughs> later on. In your thinking on these things, on the inner life, on human relations, on esoteric truths, always try to reduce a thought which you understand either dimly or clearly, reduce it in your own mind to a single, clear, concise, factual statement. Make that a practice. You'll find that it does several very good things for you. For one thing, it will make the fact clearer because then words have no opportunity to lead you away from the principal point which you want to make. As a work project, if you're going to continue to work on this after these classes, when these classes end, and I hope you do, because this is just the bare beginning. On Thursday, when there are no more classes, or tonight, you take a slip of paper, sheet of paper, and mark it one, two, three, four, and then don't make an attempt to think hard at all or you'll defeat the purpose of this practical project I'm talking about. Just sit in front of the piece of paper, try to get alone if you can, and shut off the radio, TV, and reflect a little bit about all these things we've talked about, which the great truths of the ages. There is nothing more important to your personal life than these things we're talking about. And I think I think you sense this. So you sit down with a relaxed mind, take paper and pencil, and the first thought that comes into your mind, write it down in a single short sentence, perhaps not more than 10 words. There's no exact rule on it. And then after you write it once, you look at it again and see if you can cut out a word or maybe substitute a word that will make it clearer in your mind. There's nothing more practical and to work at reducing these great profound truths to a single fact. And once you get it on paper, this reinforces it, the right kind of reinforcing in your mind. And while you're reaching for the can of Libby's peaches down at the market, all of a sudden it will strike you. This is when you're working, when you're reaching for the can of peaches in the market or hanging up the dish towel. See, we're working at this 24 hours of the day while working in other things. So what we're going to read is are some representative sentences, which you can use as models, as guides if you want. But most of all, do it for yourself, and you will find that you can go on to 50, 100, even 1,000 sentences. And who knows, you may become an author someday. This is the way you start because this makes your mind clear. When your mind is clear, other people sense it because it is very hard to find people who can state truths, esoteric truths, to say nothing of anything else in a direct, simple, punchy, single line. Most of us ramble like mad. All right. There is a secret place in you that does not feel heartache. For further reference, this is from page, if my eyes are not deceiving me here, page 63 of Pathways to Perfect Living. 
there is a secret place in you that does not feel heartache. <coughs> I wonder if in your own review of what we've covered, if you understand where this secret place is. If not, we will review it briefly. Heartache, suffering, conflict, regret, grief cannot possibly exist in you when you are in a state of consciousness. The perfect and only cure for suffering of any kind is to be in a state of consciousness, which we have always already found out is a state in which you are not thinking mechanically, but are simply being aware at the moment of where you are and of what you're doing. This is magic. A person has a distress of some kind at work or at home. So he gets out and he walks down the street and he's in a state of depression, of feeling bad about something. His emotions have taken him over. If he knew about these things we're talking about, and if you know about them, and if you no longer like being in a state of heartache, of loneliness, whatever the particular negativity might be, and you can remember yourself physically to begin with. I am walking down Colfax Boulevard. And you can detach your emotions and your mind from the state which has captured you, which has taken you over. You can snap the whole thing. And you can snap it permanently. It will, it'll come back. Because mechanical habits die very slowly. But when you do it once, you will see that it is quite possible to do it. So the secret of this secret place is to catch yourself in a state of negativity, whatever it might be, not like being in it and not liking the center of attention. You see, when I'm depressed, I'm the center of my own attention, which means I'm in a, a terrible state. But if I don't like it, I don't have to put up with it. And by becoming aware of my state, I will then dismiss thought. Remember, we said the nature of thought is to flow like a river. This is its natural healthy state. And if I get the block out of the way of liking my negative state, I remove this block, and the thought then has no choice but to flow out of my mind. And as long as I remain in a state of awareness, a state of consciousness, it can't come in and take me over again. So the secret place is a state of awareness, of consciousness, use any term you want. You want to call it of a clear mind that is free from your childhood conditioning, that's all right too. But it's a state where thought is not functioning the way it habitually functions. And as it functions in most human beings, and is why, this is why most human beings are not really happy. Most human beings have, instead of happiness, they have excitement, and they have distraction, and they have strong emotions, and they have a pretty ornament of some kind dangling in front of them. But they're always afraid of it coming to an end, which it will. In a state of true happiness, there is no concern over it coming to an end because it is not attached to anything. A happiness that has an attachment is not happiness at all, but simply a, uh, a distraction from unhappiness. If my happiness is in my, my nice family, if I have a nice family, if my happiness is in the fact that my business has doubled in the last three years, my happiness is in watching the wide world of sports on television every Saturday, then I am simply distracting myself from the unconscious pains which I don't want to face. Happiness which has no cause, no attachment, but simply is there, is authentic happiness. And you can call on it any time you want. As a matter of fact, you will never be out of it at all. Even when you're doing practical things. If you're washing the dishes, and maybe when you were a girl or a boy, you were forced to wash dishes when you'd rather be out playing. You may have had some kind of a secret dislike of washing the dishes. 
So this is a good place to work. While you, you're doing them, see if you're anxious to get them done because you'd rather be doing something else. Then you'll be able to, of all things, wash dishes consciously and you won't have any resentment against them at all. You are under no compulsion to accept discouragement. We fall under discouragement, dismay, simply because we do not know that another state is possible. We had the illustration recently in the class of the man who had been imprisoned for 50 years and that time he's pardoned. And you show him the outside world and he becomes very frightened because he's become so accustomed to his prison habits. He doesn't want to leave. All he knows is imprisonment. And you'll never tell him that the outer state is a state of freedom. This is exactly what happens to us. And so we accept, we accept what amounts to a gigantic hoax. And please bring that very common and very blunt word into your esoteric work on yourself. If I am unhappy, I am under the spell of a gigantic hoax, which I have never seen as a hoax, because I've never investigated it. You can call it suffering, you can call it a state of hypnosis, of sleep, of unawareness, and it is also something which you have never looked into and therefore do not see, is a trick. And it is a trick that mechanical thinking has played on us. This is why we're practicing self-interruption all day long. While you're washing the dishes, you watch the state of your mind. While you're driving in that horrible, thick traffic out there with the gas fumes of the truck in front of you coming in through the window, and you look and you notice that you're practically out of gas and you're in terror that you might run out before the next gas station, all these things are crossing through your mind. Are you able to interrupt all these thoughts and emotions and simply see yourself thinking these things? This is self-work. This is the beginning of the end of all discouragement. And then, and then also, by the way, we get very practical in little things. And you won't run out of gas because you're, when you get in the car in the morning, you'll be able... Have you ever seen a juggler? He can take, what, eight or ten balls and, and keep them all in there at once. This is what will happen to you. You'll be able to keep a thousand and one little things in your mind. You'll be organized, truly organized. And then you won't have to pay the penalty for being disorganized. Or I won't. <coughs> when our intuitions are right, a breakdown can lead to a breakthrough. Remember this, again the story of the man in the cave? I won't repeat it in detail, but the man down in the cave who had got very tired of sharing his miserable life underground with all these other men. And the crisis, the pain became so bad that he would rather have died than stay down in this cave. The 23 other men permitted the crisis, which was unconscious by the way, to keep them in a frozen, hardened state. And it is extremely difficult to shake a man loose when he has become too hardened because his, his hardness becomes his self, his I, and he thinks you're trying to destroy him, which we won't go into for now. But the crisis of seeing the pain, the loneliness, the conflict that we are in is a tremendous opportunity to smash forever the whole pattern May I repeat that this is not a sermon, it's not a dramatic talk. I'm not trying to impress you by telling you pretty truths. Things we are talking about are things which you can experience for yourself if you want them. If you don't like the kind of a life that you now have, you can change the life that you have. And it will be something that you cannot possibly imagine right now as you are sitting here because 
True self-transformation is never based on imagination. It's never based on the old. It is based on the absence of the old. And when the old goes, you have nothing more to do. But you have much to do, and I have much to do, to make the old go away by not liking it anymore. This is positive doubt. This is positive questioning. The desire to get out of the trap is an extremely positive emotion. The desire to blame others for being in the trap is an extremely negative emotion. Of course society did it to us. Of course it did. We're not concerned with that. We're concerned with getting out, not with finding someone to blame. You need never give the slightest thought as to whether or not you appear successful to others. What a, what a dreadful burden it is to want to make a good impression on other people. Let's illustrate that with a little, little example. There's a young man who was given a very trim and very lightweight boat, very, very nice boat going out on the lake. And uh, a young man, 20, 21 maybe. And so he went out on the boat and had a good time with it, sailing around, enjoying the water. And uh, one day he pulled into the little port there and he met some people and they saw him with a boat and they saw it and they made a suggestion to him. They said, that's a very nice boat, but it's awfully plain looking. May we sell you some nice pretty ornaments for it? And being a young man and not thinking too clearly yet, he agreed to buy some of the ornaments which turned out to be very heavy sort of things to hang over the cabin door and all over the place. So he bought the ornaments, put it all over the boat, and took it out again. And this time, time he found that the boat didn't handle quite so well as before, especially when a little storm came up. The, it didn't respond, the rudder didn't respond. And he felt that he lost control of the boat a little bit, which he had indeed because of the weights, which now made the boat lopsided as well as heavy in itself. So going back to port, once more, he met another group of people. You're following this, aren't you? He met another group of people who had some furniture to sell. <coughs> salesmen, see? Psychic salesmen. And so they sold him a bill of goods in the form of a lot of furniture, which he didn't need for the boat at all. But they wanted to profit from selling the furniture. So again, being young and not thinking very clearly, he bought the load of furniture. Now his boat is really cumbersome and heavy, so he takes it out. And in even the slightest wind or storm, it falls all over the lake and he loses control of it practically to disaster. But he's still not thinking clearly. But one time a storm comes up that is pretty near disastrous and he almost capsizes. This shock of almost going overboard and down with his boat finally clears his mind and as fast as he can get into harbor he throws off the ornaments and the heavy cumbersome furniture and goes out back and sails <coughs> naturally as it did before. I think you see the illustration of how society piles all these unnecessary things on us which because we just do not know we accept as necessary and then we wonder why our lives don't go as smoothly as they might have or as they could have. Then we get smart. What we're doing here tonight is throwing overboard all the junk, all the pretty ornaments, one of them being the need to impress other people. Do you understand from what we have covered so far why we try to impress other people? It is because we think that we possess a self which needs affirmation from other people. And have you ever noticed that there's no end to it? Maybe we please someone, maybe we even marry someone, maybe the impression went that far. But even that 
doesn't do a thing for us because now we have to keep seeking it out and there's no end to it and it keeps us very tired. When we see through a very deep understanding of all this that what we are trying to build is an illusory entity, a false sense of self, this completely ends the need to impress other people in any way at all, which does not mean that we go to the opposite and say, I don't care what you think of me, because that's just the same thing in another disguise. That's just a defense. But we are truly free of other people. And in authentic happiness. And this, this is naturalness, this is simplicity. I can't read this too well, excuse me. Whoever begins to disbelieve in his invented self-image is off on the royal road to trueness. Whoever begins to disbelieve in his invented self-image is off on the royal road to trueness. We're beginning to disbelieve something instead of to believe something. Society says believe, and by the way, when the New Testament speaks of belief and faith, they're not at all talking about what society says they are talking about. It is very easy to believe something and then stop thinking. If I believe Christ is going to save me, that ends it. I don't have to do a thing. I can be just as cruel as I was before and think that God is going to give me heaven when I die. Simply by saying, I believe, which is, which is total nonsense and self deception <laughs> I must stop believing something and stop believing that there is a way out except personal effort on my part to change myself, which is a lot of fun. I don't know anything. May I speak personally for a minute? I don't know anything that is more fun than this, just plain fun. And you get real excited over what you begin to see. And what you begin to change. And you draw a deep breath of relief about every other day because one little brick has fallen off. Through esotericism, life finally makes sense. This is one of those very, very simple sentences that I like. Ask yourself right now, how much... How much sense does life in general make to you? And how much sense does life make to you personally? If there is confusion there, the whole confusion be, can be cleared away and life will make perfect, whole, clear sense. And then, may I add, not only will life make sense, but then death will make sense to you. You will understand it. Because when you understand one, you'll understand the other, because they are not separate from each other. When life is understood, death is understood. And right here, as we are studying, we are, we are understanding both life and death. Because they are not really opposites, they are one thing. We'll take a couple more. When you clearly see what is right, you are wonderfully free from the hounding, from the hounding price of what is wrong. Very obviously, if I know that uh, certain kind of food is better for me than another, I take the one that is right and leave the inferior behind. Anything you give up in order to find the inner kingdom will be as nothing to you once you enter. This brings in the question of, of values. How reluctant we are to drop what we call valuable in our life. Because as someone, I, I believe it was someone in this room stated, we're, we're fearful of giving up all these images, all these false ideas, all these artificial actions because we're afraid there is nothing beyond it. Do you see where the, where the mistake is? Let's find out. 
I am living in a certain mental, emotional, physical, social pattern, domestic pattern, business pattern. This, this is what I know. This is familiar to me. I feel comfortable with it. Even if it makes me uncomfortable, I feel comfortable with it. Because without it, there would be a gap. This is why, for example, when a marriage breaks up, or when a friendship breaks up, there is distress. Because there is this gap where you don't know how to think. You don't know how to respond. You knew how to talk to this person before. You knew that he or she liked coffee without sugar. And this is easy. This is comfortable. But when there's no one to talk to, even in imagination maybe, there is this emptiness. And it is this emptiness that causes fear. But emptiness can only cause fear when you're comparing it with what went before, with yesterday, or 20 years ago, or five minutes ago, because you're comparing. If, when you are in any kind of a crisis, and you do not compare your state with what you had five minutes or 30 years ago, you cannot possibly be afraid, because you are no longer in the area of thought, of conditioned thought a fixed thought, of mechanical thought. Then, this emptiness is a totally new thing to you. It is a state of simple seeing, of being, in the present, without any reference to that husband, or wife, or girlfriend, or boyfriend, whom you had a lot of fun with at times, even though there are rough times too, but that's part of it, you say. And so, where there's no comparison, there is emptiness. And this emptiness, when lived in fully, without resistance, is consciousness, which in turn is freedom. And there cannot be pain, any pain whatsoever, in the present moment. Only as thought continues to run mechanically and take it over. This is so profound. authentic esotericism is rewarding. It is very difficult to convince a man to see, to convince a man that to see that his life is confused and distorted, it is hard to convince him that this is a good thing, to see it. But it is a wonderful thing to see it. The reason he doesn't want to see it, and perhaps we resist, is because if I see I am unhappy or confused, it contradicts an ideal image I have in public or in private in the corner of my mind of being a person who is not confused, who is very clear, who knows the answers. If we would just get out of Vietnam, or if we would just bomb them, or if we would do this or that, all this, this person is talking mechanically and foolishly. It makes no sense whatsoever. You'll never convince him of this because he has an image of being a person who knows what to do about Vietnam or about economics or about this or that. If he would face the shock, the emptiness, of seeing that he does not know, he would receive a reward on the spot. And do you know what the reward is, strangely enough? If I tell you this, then when it comes, you will, you will work with it better. The reward is a shock. <coughs> I've been living in dreamland all my life of being a person who understands things pretty well. Not a genius, but I, I understand things pretty well. I, my wife looks up to me, and I speak at the club, at the church sometime. And I have this beautiful image of being a man who knows what he's talking about. Then all of a sudden, some crisis comes along. My wife or husband leaves me. Some crisis, any kind, help, you name it. This is a shock. And this shock is trying to tell me that I was not the confident, free, easygoing person which I tried to make you and myself think I was. If I will bear the shock, remember we said this morning that the path to 
heaven goes straight through hell. If I will bear this pain, this suffering, and go straight through it instead of avoiding it, how do we avoid, how do we avoid shock? By 10,000 ways. By blaming someone else, by becoming upset. Suffering, suffering of any kind is an avoidance of facing the medicine that could cure you, that could cure me. We resist the medicine that could cure our suffering because we love our suffering. Because in suffering, I can blame you. I can make myself the center of attention. And so I spend my whole life suffering, never knowing that I could have been out of the whole mess any time I wanted to, really wanted to. By grasping all these facts and then operating on them daily while washing the dishes, while driving the car in the smoggy Colfax Avenue, by getting a letter that has bad news. You ever got a letter with bad news and watched yourself react to it? You ever watched yourself? There was a movie, uh, where was it? I'm sure, not sure whether it was in my city or here. It was the story of F. Scott Fitzgerald, the author of In the 30s. And one little scene showed him, uh, apparently his books had started to lose popularity or something, and he was drinking and so on. And one scene showed him his last big chance to make a comeback as a writer. And he went out to the mailbox and got the letter out, which was from his agent. And this, this was it. This was the climax. If his book was accepted, <laughs> hooray, he was on the way again as a famous author. Uh, if it didn't, he, he was through. It was all washed up. So he went out. It was the last of part of the movie, so you, you knew that <laughs> what was going to happen, because if you knew his life. So he got the letter out of the mailbox and um, opened it and of course, the, we could see his face, and you knew what the letter said, that the agents couldn't sell his book. So he went in, and eventually, a few minutes later, the movie ended, and his life ended in defeat and despair. Because he didn't know, among billions of other human beings, that when something like this happens, you get a disappointing letter, a disappointing expression from your spouse, a disappointing, disapproving look from the boss, that you do not need to go under on it, on any one of them. I don't care what it has to do with it. You can take it as if it is nothing. And I will repeat once more, and then we'll go into the questions. This is not pretty talk. I have no time for pretty talk in my life, or nor would I give it to you. Freedom is quite possible. We're working hard, and we'll get out too. All right, what's your comments or questions? Yes? Well, it's quite different if you're accepting it, but you still can't get the handle on yourself. I mean, it, it's, it, you understand, I've talked quite a bit about other people, it's still, you're getting a handle on yourself so soon to be a problem. A lot of these things you said, I guess, people are happy and so forth. You've gotten so far a certain part now, the road, but it like you're there. I don't, I don't know. How do you get the rest of the way? <laughs> if I may repeat your question, are you saying that even if you do work and nothing changes, what do you do in a case like that? Well, it does change. It's quite a bit of change that's already. Tremendous amount. But now it's getting harder to see how the rest of the change is pulled out. Well, two comments. One, one of the greatest friends you have in the esoteric word is that beautiful, beautiful word, persistence. You persist in spite of everything. Now I'll tell you another, I'll, I'll tell you a little, little thing that happens when you start to work. May I repeat an illustration, perhaps for the third time? The man is asleep in the canoe in the river going down to the waterfall. He's asleep in the canoe. He has no problems, nothing disturbing. He's living in a beautiful dream. He's asleep, as humanity is. You're standing on the bank and you see him drifting toward the waterfall, so you yell and throw some rocks and you wake him up. He gets up and he sees, for heaven's sakes, the waterfall ahead of him a half a mile. He had no resistance, no challenges whatsoever before, did he? He was living in dreamland, heading right for the waterfall. Now, my heaven's sake, 
This is terrible. He grabs a paddle and he, he paddles like mad. Look at the fight he has now. But he is fighting for his life and he's not just drifting down there. When you start to work, the devil starts to work. He didn't have to do anything before he had you. This is right. You're arousing tremendous resistance when you start to awake. But if you're aware of this, you can slip by it without falling under. This is just another trick to make you discouraged. The, so, I'll tell you how hard you are working. The degree you are working is the degree to which you are in distress and conflict. You must keep yourself in conflict. You must keep yourself distressed. You must keep yourself uncomfortable. When you get comfortable, you're not working. You're asleep. Then there does come a, a time where at a certain point you have begun to die because you begin to understand. Die to falsehood, you understand to illusion. Then the struggle at a point, and don't you dare imagine this point because this will be a trick played on you. When you get to a certain point, authentic relaxation, authentic contentment begins to enter. Then that begins to build more and more and that continues forever. Take those two points and think those over. The most important one being the plain old word, import, uh, persistence, and may I add, an intense self-honesty. Yeah. <coughs> you said that you can't be in pain if you are aware. Can't you consciously watch yourself in pain? You do not consciously watch yourself in pain because when you are conscious, you can't be in pain. The two states, obviously, consciousness and pain, cannot exist at the same second. What you can do is in thought look back and say, I was distressed a moment ago. This is thought watching an experience of five minutes ago. And this is where your work begins on the level of proper thought. When you're free from thought altogether, there cannot possibly be pain. The two are, are, are opposites in that sense. Thought can look back and remember that you were in pain a minute ago. Then you can understand many things about that pain. Why was I suffering? Because I didn't get the compliment that I expected for my work, or I didn't get the appreciation I wanted. Then you can see, also see that the moment you were suffering, you were also asleep. Because had you been awake, when you didn't get the appreciation, you would not have suffered. Because you would not have expected that appreciation to fulfill a sense of self. Because you don't have such a sense of self, and you finally see it. Then nothing can touch you. Which does not mean you don't have a lot of experiences, and a lot of fascinating ones, by the way. too much but we will get it briefly for various reasons when you say the word death you are using a word correct so far when you use the word life you are using a word that human beings have agreed that if you put your lips in a certain way like this it comes out life and you put your lips in another way it comes out the word death these are words and words do not include the whole they are simply a way of, ex of convenience of expressing things on this level. So the first step is to get words out of the way. Because when you use any word, we tend, and all human beings not only tend, but do, identify with one side. You remember we have covered this many times, that a person takes a side in life, and a free man never takes a side, People say, oh, you've got to be committed in life. You don't have any backbone. See, this is because they don't understand that they are trapped by taking a side in order to feel alive by fighting the opposite side. So we identify with life, and more specifically, we identify with what we call a self in this life. And that is the beginning of fear of death. Because when you take any side, you fear the opposite. Take any example you want. I am a 
Frenchman and you are a Nazi. I am afraid of you because you're a Nazi. Take all social divisions and you'll see to one degree or other opposing political parties. You become afraid, perhaps not too much in a democracy, of the opposite political party. Or you become afraid of, of anything that opposes the position you have that gives you an idea of who you are. So by identifying with life, we become afraid of death. If you did not identify with life, then the fear of death could not exist. And this happens when you die while you're still alive. You can die while you're still alive, which is what we're really doing here. We're dying to what? To falsehood, to false ideas about who we are. Then if you die now, death has nothing more to take from you, which it never did anyway, by the way, but we thought so. So I, have, I can now stop frantically trying to ensure, trying to ensure the continuance of my name because I see that it was something that if you spell it with letters it comes out a certain way on a piece of paper or you say it, it you hold your mouth in a certain way it's nothing more than that because I do not take my label as myself which it never was anyway so I no longer have that so I no longer need to hold on to it which does not mean that I cease to exist in my present physical sense in my cosmic sense we're here You mentioned just a few minutes ago that have you ever watched yourself react to bad news? Yes. Well, you're really not watching yourself react. You're remembering. Very good. Very good. Very good. That clears up the Yes, I, I'm sorry. Very good. You're remembering what happened a moment ago. This is, this is why Gurdjieff talked, remember yourself. Yes? Would you explain the third way we just did a minute ago, but we'll expand it. Let's see if we can get a good example. I, I try to use as many as possible, and sometimes you run out of them. All right, you you belong to one country. You're you're an Algerian, and I'm a a Moroccan. At least we get out of Europe. I identify myself as an Algerian. This is one way of thinking, one identity I've given myself. You identify yourself as a Moroccan. This is an opposite to me. This is a third, a second way of thinking. They are opposites now. Now we fight each other and put borders up and have wars and all that. Because if, if I'm an Algerian, but I don't know I'm an Algerian until I create you as a Moroccan, because I can't fight nothing. I have to find someone to fight. I have to fight an enemy. If I call myself an Algerian, I have to create a Moroccan to have someone to fight. And by this fighting, I think that I exist, never seeing the whole thing as an illusion to hang on to my false identity as an Algerian. So far, okay? Third way of thinking is where you have no identity at all as either an Algerian or a Moroccan, and which is not on the level of thought at all, but on the level of consciousness of a clear mind, where there are no labels, and therefore no opposites. This is why I said the other night, if you want to completely vanish every single enemy without exception, just do this work and learn to think in a proper clear way, which is either in practical thought for everyday use or in a state of clear consciousness, of awareness. There are no enemies in awareness because God has no enemies at all. The devil is not God's enemy at all. God does not have an opposite. False gods have an opposite. Human authorities have an opposite. Human representatives of, quote, God have an opposite. And his opposite is another human authority. The third way of thinking is simply to think clearly and consciously. Yes. Without opinions, forming opinions? Yes, of course, there are no opinions. Is it possible then to read a newspaper, for example, without saying, this is good news and this is bad news? Uh, certainly. Because you're not forming an opinion based on human judgment at all. Because you are above human opinions and judgments. And you see the whole thing is complete nothing. There are things, some things I cannot possibly say here for various reasons. Sometime we will say them. 
regarding governments, and regarding religious organizations. Yes, Jim. If you refer to the devil, would you identify what you mean by the devil? No, I don't believe in the devil. There is no. Is the simplest thing in the world to define, and this is why you can get rid of it. Uh, look, we have all these kid ideas, you know, the red suit and the pitchfork. The devil is only anything or some person who opposes what you desire. If you have no false desires, you cannot possibly create the devil. We, we don't believe in the devil either, you understand? I'm using just as common a words as I can in order to explain these things. The devil is simply someone who opposes what you want. If you didn't want it, it wouldn't exist. Ah, I want to be a millionaire. The devil is anyone who opposes, who stands in my way. The, the buyer who won't buy $10,000 worth of my goods because the competitor is a little cheaper. He becomes the devil who stands in the way of my million dollars. Uh, bad health. One day I, I have a sickness to last. This is the devil that stands in the way. If I am, don't want a million dollars, because I've seen other things, by the way, then I have no opposition to getting a million dollars. And because it is a false desire to begin with, then I don't create all these thousand and one oppositions or devils which stand in the way. I create every single opposition I have. There are no exceptions. You never create any problem for me. You cannot possibly. You can't create any problem for me. I cannot create any for you. I create it, my own problem, because there's something functioning wrongly in me. And I like to have opposition, by the way, because this makes it seem as if my cause is legitimate. If you're the enemy government and I want to overthrow you, I must make you a devil. If, if I call you a good government, I can't justify myself in overthrowing you. So you're evil and I'm good. Then I get in power and someone else makes me the devil and overthrows me. And this is the madness of mankind. One more, then I think we better go downstairs. Yes. In the selection of words, might it not be wise to think that words are little bodies and every word, every body has a soul. And if we can get the soul of that word, then we come to complete understanding. I, I'm not quite following clearly, but if, if you mean that word, certain words can represent certain truths, maybe? I think they do. It's a matter of language. Yes. And if we can uh, get the soul of this word, okay. then I think we are coming to an understanding that uh, it's beneficial to all. Maybe, maybe, if you mean this, and that, that is very good, perhaps if I understand the word freedom correctly, to understand that the word freedom means freedom from my false self for my own illusions, then the word freedom becomes quite a beautiful guidepost. Perhaps that's what you mean, I don't know. Did you want to comment further? Not necessarily, no, I just, I know yeah. that words, and, uh, and uh, depending on what part of the world you're from, different words mean different things. That's true, which is why if we can drop certain words, then we will not mechanically react to their meaning and therefore will not be influenced by them. Consciousness is not on the word level, on the verbal level at all. Words are on the level of thought. Consciousness does not have words and therefore it is not divisive as words are. Wherever you have yes, you must have no. Wherever you have up, you must have down. I think we better go downstairs for now. <coughs> Two or three uh, questions came up downstairs, and I think we will simply discuss these and have further questions on them, if you like, during the last part of the evening. And we'll start with the idea, two people ask about results. How do results connect with everything we're talking about? And the question was centered not so much around inner results of our work, but what attitude do we take toward 
results in our daily work, in our human relations. When I am in a state, we always come back to the same answer. When I am a, in a healthy-minded state, and I am selling groceries for a living, or I am in relation with a member of my family or several members of my family, and something happens, whatever happens, unless I am using this event in an attempt to affirm a false sense of existence, or rather to rephrase it, if I am not using the results of this to affirm me, I see this result, whether society has labeled as good or bad, I see this result even when it affects me quite personally, perhaps financially. I wanted to make the sale of a carload of shoes, and it means a, a large commission to me to make this sale. Now, what happens to me if I make the sale, first of all, let's say I, I make it. I become elated, do I not? Not necessarily, no. <coughs> Go ahead. I'm just, that's just, uh, I don't think you would necessarily. Yes. Generally speaking, a person would become elated by making a sale and making a large commission. On the other hand, if he didn't make it, most people would be disappointed. You were counting on making that extra $500 to pay for the furniture. Either reaction is a false reaction. And remember, this is the way the world lives. I am not going to live that way. And I hope you are not going to live that way. It is just as damaging to the whole of your life or my life, to be elated over making the sale as not making. And I know exactly what people say when you tell them this. I know exactly, because they always say the same thing. They always say, oh, but you are dead. You have no response. You are dead to life. Life is made to feel. Now, the reason they say this, obviously, and there's no answer when they say this, they will be totally unable to comprehend what you're talking about, so you don't even try. I have mentioned many times, you don't even try to talk to these things, but to the vast majority of people. They say this because either the elation or the depression, whichever the way the event, the result comes out, gives them an exciting feeling, which in my books I have finally given them special phrase to it, called it a false feeling of life. If I get elated over a good result, I will be depressed over what I call a bad result. If I want to be free of depression, which everybody says they do, I must also be willing to be free of elation, which no one wants to give up. A no from life is telling me, trying to tell me, a very important thing about myself, which is that I am living from a completely false system of thought. But I resist this no because I'm afraid to take its answer as final and as true, which it is. Which, by the way, is why no is the greatest teacher on earth to those who want to wake up. You'll never learn from yes. I get a string of sales of selling my carload of shoes, seven in a row, which happens according to certain accidents or laws. <laughs> the way things happen. <laughs> we'll be into it in a minute. <coughs> And about the seventh time, I begin to feel like a petty little god. 
And then on the eighth time, when I get a no, I get real bitter. Because I now, this little image I have of being a God who can and should control results has not been affirmed by life. As a matter of fact, it has been denied by life. And remember, we said life out there, in a, on a certain level, always operates in yes and no. But if you are living above yes and no, which is the third way of thinking, which is a state of consciousness, of awareness, then yes and no, see, you're here, and yes and no, they pass right under you. Because you have given up a false sense of who you are, you no longer love elation, false, which is false, and you no longer love depression. You think people don't love depression? We've gone into this many times. This is false use of emotions. Now to answer the question, but you, sir, are not involved in life. You're living in some airy atmosphere and you're not living in a practical, down-to-earth, dog-eat-dog -dog world, which it is. I certainly am not, and I have no intention of ever doing so. If you want to live insanely, you continue this way. I'm through with it. I'm out. And that's all you said. You'd never say it to them. You say it to yourself. So, results can free you from results when used properly. But if I have all these phony self-images of about who I am, I will then make a demand upon results to affirm them, which means my entire life consists of up on top of the roller coaster and five seconds later down in the lower part and depressed, then up again and down again, up and down again, which means I am not at all in control of my own life, but I am a mere machine. I'm the leaf in the wind out there. In any way it blows, I have to go because I have no mind of my own. I want a mind of my own where I am not ex influenced by every external event, where I am in charge of events by not making any demand on them at all. When I have, listen to this, Have, to have no power at all is to be completely powerful. Total defeat is total victory. Do you understand? Is there someone who, uh, well, this is the open session now. We're going to continue until the open, until 9.30 or so. Is there someone here who would like to comment on that? Please, this is important. I would like to have a talk to them. Yeah. Pardon? And I can make this guy. Discuss a little more? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, you're just saying you actually transcend these conditions. Very good. And transcend. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, Let's say you have to make sell shoes to make a living. Okay, fair enough. Well, what should be your attitude about selling it? I mean, you're trying to at least make enough food maybe to feed the family or something. I mean, why, why do you have any attitude at all? Why don't you just sell your shoes? Well, you got to have an attitude some part, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm selling a good pair of shoes, what attitude do I need? You as a customer, you come in, I show you the shoes. And on this level, we have a simple, direct, this level transaction. There's no problem involved unless there's something wrong with me or with the customer. How incredibly few things can be done in this world, be done and be done with it. Why don't you just sell shoes and be done with it? Why don't you just wash the dishes, and be done with it. And instead of being emotionally involved in it, 
unconsciously, or whatever it might be. Well, there are certain sales where you have to create a need and then sell. Well, that's on the level of, of everyday salesmanship, perhaps, which we are we have nothing to do with here. Oh, I'm just thinking you'd have to have an attitude on that, though. You'd have to have to... Well, explain maybe a little more. What, what you <clears throat> well, uh, it's not just as simple as coming in, you know, when a customer wants something. You, you have to kind of, again, create the need for them. So I would think that you would... Uh, <laughs> You know, you would have to get involved in this sort of thing. Well, if a customer, why, why can't you just give a... It isn't just take it and leave it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, as far as the customer is concerned. Look, a customer comes in and he asks me for a pair of nine, ten shoes. We have a simple transaction. Maybe the size isn't right. I go back and get another. What I'm trying to say is, can't we simple, simply operate on the basis of facts of simple practical thinking without getting unnecessarily involved, for example, getting upset if the, the shoe isn't right or the price went up two dollars or something like that. Go ahead. Need selling is really the same as any selling. What it is, it's a matter of doing the best job that you know how to do without being concerned about what the results are. Right. But, uh, but just one second. You will become a far more efficient businessman or a salesman, you'll be far more efficient in anything if you do this because you're not wasting your energy on unnecessary emotions. Of course your business work is going to be entirely different because you are a different human being. You can do any kind of business you want that's an honest business and be in this work. Yeah. Or we are, whoever's involved, is trying to sell the shoes, not themselves. Very good. Very good. One way to put it. Yeah, I think you had something which. Well, I know you. Are you saying no emotion or only certain emotion? Only proper attitudes. Oh. I don't see any need for emotions whatsoever in selling a pair of shoes because that's the wrong center operating. Oh, I see. You're, there uh, is a time when an emotion is more appropriate. Of course. But not. Of course. We had the example yesterday. You listen to music with your emotions. If you listen to music with your mind, you wouldn't hear it rightly. Because music touches the emotions more than the mind. See? And when you uh, get rid of the false cells, and you, uh, the true self knows when to feel the which emotion. Which center to use. If I have a, a flat tire in my car out here when I go out, and, and I change the, tra the tire with my emotions, because I'm, I'm, I wanted to be home in five minutes, and I get grease on my suit, I'm using the wrong center to change that tire i should use my mind to change it not my feelings try to separate the two and see if you're doing the work you're doing with the proper center Many people aren't. pardon Many people aren't and they're going through a great deal of uh, rigmarole but, but. yes well, what about the uh, false pressures put on by probably a sales manager or the company president with quotas with the prizes, a, pri a prize trip to Hawaii by the best salesman, and so on. These are the things that cause pressures. And okay. okay. All right. I'll, I will have to tell you after all. When you have found yourself, you will never be engaged in anything like that whatsoever. You're not going to be involved in anything of a charlatan, and I'm not saying this is, of a swindling nature, of a pressure nature. If you, if you have to go out and make three dollars a day, if that will keep bread on your table, you do that and stay out of insanity, whether it's that sort of thing or government or anything else. And when you have a free mind, you won't give two cents whether you make all that money or not. I'm not being dramatic. You won't be involved in these things because there's nothing to prove anymore. It is a wonderful state to be in where you don't have to prove anything and then you will not be divided from yourself. But if you are in a bad business position where, for example, dishonesty and pressure and all that is put on people and you start into this, it's a wonderful opportunity to start seeing yourself because you'll begin to see the difference between living a simple, honest, decent life 
and being involved in the madness of society, eventually you will fall away from these things. Then, being a true human being is more important than anything on earth. And you're going to go all alone, too. No one's going to go with you. But that makes absolutely no difference. You're going to live and die all alone. Look, one thing that I'll... It is your life, and don't you forget that. It's not your husband's life. It's not your wife's life. It's not your government's life. It's not your family's life. It's your life. Don't you forget it. Good. Is enthusiasm over what you're doing wasting energy? Not if you're whole. If you're one, you can sell shoes with great enthusiasm and a great deal of pleasure, great deal of fun. Whatever you do is fun. I tell you, apply this to your business life. Go ahead. And you see how much more fun you have instead of, instead of dragging your heels down at 8 in the morning and resenting everything you have to do. Because everything you do is fine because you are one with yourself. And you're not envious of the guy with the golf club walking by and he's playing golf and you have to sell shoes. He's using that for an escape to begin with. You don't have to escape. You can sell shoes and be in perfect happiness. If you don't think so, you try it. Uh, this is a little different subject. You mentioned, I think, last night something about what we're trying to do in this program is get away from the self-image. Right. Uh, and then I wondered how the book up here, is it picture, uh, photography or something? One of the books you wrote, it doesn't this deal with self-images? Nothing to do with self-images. It has to do with thinking properly. These are examples. If you'll read the book, you'll see that these are examples. And examples help the mind bridge the, between the known and the unknown. This is not building images, it's the exact opposite of destroying images. These are examples, which is a different thing. So you don't think it's valuable at all to have an image of yourself sort of succeeding or things of this nature? It's no, you, you must not have any images. We have gone over this so many times. Images separate you from yourself because an image excludes the opposite. What we're trying to do, transcend the opposites. Go ahead. I insist on using my words. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, now, as far as children go, uh, in order, uh, they have an image. Now, you couldn't, uh, a kid couldn't work this, could they? So, in a case mm -hmm. like this, wouldn't, uh, and put myself on a child level, maybe I, maybe I have to go from a bad image to a good image before I can go to a no image? Could this possibly be <laughs> no, a step? No, no, you must, uh, again, you must not say there are good images. See? Yeah. There are no good images and bad images. They're all bad images. Well, on certain levels of thinking, there are good and bad images, aren't there, though? Well, could we cut the word out, images, altogether, and say, in connection with children, why can't you simply tell a child that it is proper to pick up your toys after you drop them, train them without any ref? I don't see why images have to be brought in. It. They're going to have enough. They're going to, I mean, they're brought in whether you want it or not, because... Any an image of being good is a very evil man. Well, there is, there is for him because he's created, you see. He's not above it yet. And he causes all kind of troubles in the world. It's, you see, it's an evil for, for kids 18 year old to have their arms blown off in some form. That, that is evil, is it not? Is it evil to cause people suffering? This evil would stop if men understood if they were above it, but they're not above it. So it's perfectly proper to use the word, but then we have to understand what we're talking about yet. Yeah. Well, if you didn't have suffering, it would like you wouldn't have evil awakening. I mean, I don't know, if you're fat and happy, it's not normal to start searching. I, we have said many times that we use suffering, not love it. We use the very state to free us from the state, which is quite another thing from loving it. I say love it. People love it. People love their suffering. They love pain. That is great. 
I right. suffered and I didn't love it. I disagree. I said I suffered and I didn't love it. All right. All right. We have to begin to unlove it. There is such a word. Have you found that your energy and efficiency have increased as uh, you have been in the process of uh, losing these things? It, 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 this happens automatically. You're not wasting it and all these other things. Remember we said even your income goes up. You want to talk about money. Because you stop spending your money on foolish things. You become... Boy, you ladies here, you love me after saying this. Uh, this is true. Now, what I'm telling you, this I don't generally go into this, but you'll see. You'll be able to walk into a supermarket. <laughs> you, you like bargains? You will be a hawk. You'll be able to, in a glance, tell the best price on beets from this can of beets. And this is right. I'm not exaggerating. You, your mind will be fantastically sharp. You think this is impractical on that level, you stick with it. <coughs> we have about five more minutes before 9.30 if you want to conclude something. On, pos yes. on positive doubt that you mentioned earlier, this is actually evaluating some of the labels that we Very picked up. Questioning, probing, examining. Very good. This is not, not the kind of a doubt that leads to confusion, but to clarity. When I begin to doubt, uh, uh, doubt the trustworthiness of the boat, I'm, that's a positive doubt because now I can repair the leak in it. That's the best example I can pull out of the air. But it's really hard to walk away from something you've lived with, like churches and things like that. That's what we've been saying. That's, that's why... That's why in this group we're, we're putting everything possible on our side. It's incredibly stacked against us, but we have started to work against it. Now, now that we've got rolling a little bit, we're getting all these facts, all these discussions on our side. But once you leave this group, you have to go home and work. And I'm sure most of you will to one degree or other. Because you have sensed something here. I know you have. Just one question. I, you know, I was reading Spensky, and do you have to have a class to, to be able to develop? I think he's saying in this kind of work that you have to be with a group or something. You have to find a school, I think what he's saying. Yeah, a school. Do you really have to do that? When you are thinking correctly, you are in school right now, when you're all alone in your house. Do not think of school as necessarily being a bunch of people gathered together. Excuse me. Go Pardon? May I ask a personal question? Yes. Uh, where did you gain your knowledge? Is this intuitive insight, or did you do your research? By doing everything we've been talking about. But I mean, how did you learn how to do these things? Hard work. I have no other answer except to do everything that we've talked about. I, I, I've never known an esoteric school in my life. I've never heard of one, and I don't intend to find one. Well, how I tried did you it one time. How did you know how to work? and to do these things? How did you reach the conclusions to, to know what to do? Well, a, a simple example, all right? Maybe you read a good book of some kind, and this book says you do a certain thing. You start to observe yourself in daily action, to see yourself as you are. And the book says, if you do that, you will be surprised to find that you're an entirely different kind of person than you thought you were. Okay, that's what it says. I'll try it out and see what happens. So I, I forget it for a month, and I now read it again, six weeks later and I say it says the same thing and I forget about it because I'd rather watch television but all the time something is nagging at me see see I'm not happy I'm not satisfied so for the ninth time I read if you observe yourself you'll see that you're a different kind of person than you thought you were finally I get just enough energy because I want enough to change that I start doing this and I find out it's true I'm in school I'm in my own school then you do that a thousand times, ten thousand times. You're proving the truth for yourself to yourself. See? There is no other evidence than your own knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. This is how it works. This is what I've found. Well, let's say a person's got a mental problem or something. They really couldn't 
do these things. I mean, I always wondered about that. I mean, a person has a personality problem or something like that, and I guess there's no way they could ever solve the problem, or it's just not meant for them to be then, I guess, right? It doesn't look like it's, I mean, what I'm getting at is, uh, it looks like you have to have certain attributes before you can go to that school. Could, you, could I say a word? Earlier, you were talking about absolute powerlessness is all power. And I was thinking about, in Alcoholics Anonymous, the first step of that program is a complete surrender to the fact that uh, you are powerless. And in that is absolute recovery. And there isn't anything until you reach that state of Same defeat. Right. See, then we'll end. When I am totally humiliated by something, my wife leaves me, my business fails, anything. When I am totally humiliated, totally defeated, and remain in that, I have destroyed the idealistic image that there is something else. See, I've destroyed an image of success because remaining in this suffering, this is all there is. When there is just suffering, there is nothing but that. Therefore, I have no hope anymore, but I have to stay with this, and that destroys the opposites. I can't explain it, but you experience it. You stay right in the center of where you are, and don't seek an escape from any pain that you have, and you will see a miracle in your life. You have to go through this, and you can, in little ways at first, little things. Then you're not resisting what you have called evil whoever denied you something. You are not resisting. Therefore, you don't exist anymore because the opposite doesn't exist anymore. Now, you have let your humiliation completely destroy what you have called, quote, me. Then, when you are destroyed, the suffering is destroyed because now there's no opposite and no hope. When you have no hope, you are free. Oh, one more answered his question and he was saying perhaps is God unfair with certain people uh, people who are retarded that have personality problems that will never be able to search for the truth no you must not even think about this because you'll get utterly confused and there will be false sympathy here obviously no, people are not born free and equal it is simply not a fact people are not born free and equal you work on yourself. May I uh, conclude with one thing? Please, in your self-work, do not give your mind to astrology, to reincarnation, to telepathy, to questions and ideas which are of no profit to your immediate understanding. Because you'll never understand certain things because there is no understanding in them. To ask a question about astrology, for example, is completely false. It has no answers for you at all. And you're draining energy, and I would be, I would be draining my energy even to try to answer them if they did have an answer. There are, remember, and then we stop. People used to come to Buddha and ask him all kinds of questions. He absolutely refused to discuss them. Not because he was rude or something like that, but because there is absolutely no profit in it. And to answer it is to further the illusion that you can find something outside of the main process of finding yourself. Then, all these other questions about reincarnation, about astrology and faith healing, the questions disappear instead of being answered. Beware of people who give you answers to these sort of things. Die to the question. Then you will know the answer, but it won't be on the level of yes and no. The question will disappear. It's 9.35, I think we'll quit.